The Creative Community is brought to you in part by a generous grant provided by the Diana and Simon Rabb Foundation. Welcome to the Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and today we'll be talking with members of SCAPE, Southern California Artists Painting for the Environment. Then we'll head over and talk to iconic writer Ashley Brilliant. Well, Rita Ferry, it is always a pleasure to see you because I know when I do and it's on TV, we're going to see something really great. We're always going to see art. Yeah. What, 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 is, what is happening today? Today we are in the Channing Peak Gallery, right. which is a county administration building. Right. And it's first the floor, yeah. very first floor here. And we have rotating exhibitions. And the exhibition we hear, have here right now is called Near and Far plain air in county parks mm -hmm. and it was a wonderful idea to invite the scape group which is uh, southern california artists painting for the environment right. <laughs> and to invite them to go out into our county parks and document them yeah. and uh, this fabulous exhibition is the result of yeah. all their hard work now, we're, we're taping here in mid-December. The show is up until? The show will be here till uh, January 14th, okay. and then it travels to Santa Maria. Right. So if you're in the North County, you can see it at the Betteravia Government Building, okay. and it will be there till May. Right. So you'll have a good long time to see it. And even if you're down in Santa Barbara, you can drive up there. It's, you know, Absolutely. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, it's yeah. very easy to find right off the Betteravia exit. Okay. And well, and I love the fact that the Channing Peak is, you know, we're on the corner of Anacapa and Anapamu, across from the Coffee Cat, across from the courthouse. People are downtown all the time, and I think it's rare that they just walk through here because they should. There's mm -hmm. always going to be something that's really nice. Well, you know, it actually isn't so rare. Okay. I tell people, if you're in this gallery, this gallery gets more coverage than almost any other oh, place, wow. and for a good reason. People who work downtown, right. people who work at the museum, walk through, through this building, <laughs> walk through that parking lot and to, right. they go to the museum or they go downtown right, right. because they don't park here. Right. So this is the pathway for all yeah. interested art people right. and uh, for people that don't usually come here, um, they, they come should. to pay yeah. their taxes. Yeah. Yeah. One woman <laughs> wrote me and said, I look forward every year to seeing your show at tax when time. I and so I said, please come more often, you know. <laughs> Well, that's funny. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I wanna, we're going to talk to Jane Hurd um, from SCAPE in just a mm -hmm. second. Uh, tell me a little bit about your process for deciding what's actually going to go up in the Channing Peak Gallery, which is, you just informed me is one of the, mm -hmm. the best spaces to have mm -hmm. work exhibited. Well, I in the Channing Peak Gallery, we usually have group shows. Uh, we have had single artists, but usually they're artists that have passed. They're mm -hmm. famous artists right. like Channing Peak or... Uh, the outsider artist Ralph Ofterheide, mm -hmm. but we like yeah. to showcase all the county artists that we have. Right. Um, later on this year, we'll be having the printmakers. Uh, right after this show, we will have a show called Under the Influence, and it is. That sounds kind of uh, racy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really uh, about reflections of the land, and that's coming from okay. the North County, and that's all photography. Mm -hmm. It, the shows can be very diverse and uh, we just usually try to appeal to a wide right. audience with our exhibition. And I think it's great that over the last, it seems to me like five or ten years, there's been a real effort to make a North County, South County connection. Absolutely. We want to have North County represented. Mm -hmm. And if you go to that building now, there's really been a transformation because of the Percent for Art program. Mm -hmm. They did a remodel, so there was a little bit more money to spruce up the galleries, to add art to the hearing room. Mm -hmm. And you can even see it on camera when you watch the mm -hmm. supervisors. Okay, great, great. Well, Rita, I'm going to say thank you, and I'm going to um, uh, fade to black as we bring in Jane uh -huh. Hurd. Thank you so thank much. You so much.
So now I'm here with Jane Hurd, who is the chair of the e e exhibitions? What, what's exhibits. Your? Exhibits for Escape. For Escape. Um, and we were talking just a minute ago to, to Rita Ferry, and, and Rita said that the show here at the Channing Peak was over on January 15th. She meant to say February 15th of 2015. Correct. So Correct. People have a little bit more time to, to come here before it goes to Santa, Bar yes. uh, Santa Maria. Um, you know, Jane, as someone who, who's really interested in scape itself, I'd like you to tell me what is it? People may have never heard of it before. Well, as Rita said, a Southern California artist painting for the environment, and we are plein air painters. Scape has around 200 members, and plein air means is from the French en plein air, which means painting in plain air. So we're landscape painters. And because we depend on the environment for our inspiration and our subject matter, we are a group of people that want to contribute to preserving the environment. And we hold two to four exhibits a year that raise money for an environmental cause. And this show was for the county parks. Mm -hmm. And we planned for it for a number of months. We, we had organized paint outs where members all gather, we pick a county park, and everybody's there. Everybody gathers and we paint for three or four hours and hopefully come out with paintings that are good enough for the show. And we did this for a number of months prior to the show. Well, I, I, when I walk around here, I see so many places that I myself have been and I'm sure a lot of Santa Barbara residents will feel the same way. It's a kind of exciting thing to see it through the eyes of an artist. Yes. Um, it, it, and it's so interesting, especially when you see the same scene painted by different artists. Absolutely. How much very, you know, and that's one of the fun things about the paint out. But you may have 20 people there. They're all crowded 20, around. I've seen them. In 20 a paintings beach, yeah. of the same scene, and they're all totally different. Right, right. So if someone's watching this and they're like, oh, that sounds great. I'd love to do this. I'd love to paint for the environment. I, I, I am a plain air painter outside all the time. How do they join Skate? It's very simple. You don't even need to be a painter. We have some members that just appreciate what we do. It, it, you just pay $35 and fill out a membership application, mm -hmm. and you're a member. And, and then, escape.org, is that the? Right. right. So before we, we're going to talk to some of the artists who are here. Um, what, what should we be aware of? What, what, what sort of questions would you ask them if you were me? What, what, what's the most important thing to sort of elicit from the people who are in the show? Gosh, I, one question I always wonder is, why do we paint? Mm -hmm. Asking people what, what is their drive for painting? And some people, like, I can't even totally answer why I paint. It's just a, it's a passion. Mm -hmm. It's a passion and a drive and a love. A love of nature mm -hmm. is my main motivating factor. So it might be interesting to ask others mm -hmm. And you know, one interesting thing too about this show is that it's not just, uh, you know, what we would think of as the natural world. There's a number of courthouse pieces, including your own. Right, because these were county parks and open spaces, mm -hmm. which includes the sunken garden of the courthouse, okay. which is a beautiful place, and a lot of painters paint there very often. One interesting thing about Santa Barbara is there are so many painters here that most people in town are accustomed to seeing mm -hmm. painters out there, with their yeah. easel all over town. Yeah. and. You see quite a few at the courthouse. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all the good work you're doing. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for the show. So, Nancy Freeman, congratulations on being chosen as the first place winner of the of the exhibition. Thank you. I was very surprised and very pleased. Yeah. So, um, how did you find out that that you were that you were the winner? I. I, I, well, I didn't know until I came to the opening, oh. <laughs> and then and then they announced, uh, you know, other prize winners, right. including me, and it was a surprise. It was yeah. very nice. It's a, we, we, you and I want to keep our faces to the camera, but our, our our faces are also drawn back to this really striking picture, and it's an afternoon, sh late afternoon shadow, shank of the day coming onto the sand. We see the the bluffs of Galita Beach. Um, tell me a little bit about the the painting. Well, first of all, that time of the day is the most beautiful, and it's very hard to actually paint outdoors at that time. Because um, you can't see the canvas? And... Well, no, because the light fades so rapidly. Yeah, right. And since painting is mostly about light, right. catching the it's light. It's changing quickly. Right. Yeah. And so I took uh, several photographs of that because I love that time of day. It's mm -hmm. really the most beautiful. And it was a pleasure to do that painting and to have it get first prize. Right. So, so some of it's painted out in the open air at some in your studio or is it mostly in the studio? Mostly that one was done in the studio uh -huh. from 
from uh, pictures, right. photographs that I took because that time of day, as I yeah. said, is so yeah. hard to do uh, yeah. outside. Is that, would you say, a relatively common phenomenon for plain air painters? To, uh, especially in the evening, to, to have to take the work out? I think sometimes yeah. people do take photographs so they can finish them. Mm -hmm. uh, Although painting outdoors, as uh, Churchill said, is one of the most exciting things to do. Why is that? I, I don't know. To be sitting out there in something beautiful uh -huh. and to try to capture what you feel about it is just, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's really exciting. A lot of people don't know that painting really is an absolute joy. Right. How did you get involved with Scape yourself? Well, I came here to Santa Barbara five years ago and um, it was just one of several organizations that I joined, but I also like the idea that they do plein air painting, which as I said, I really love doing, mm -hmm. sitting out there. We, we look at this, we can recognize some rocks and plants, a little vegetation in the back, but it could almost be an abstract uh, expressionist painting. It's really, shape is very important there, isn't it? Well, you know, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design and the first two years we spent just doing abstracts right. and looking at abstracts. Uh -huh because abstracts is a way of getting your composition set up, which is crucial mm -hmm. to a painting. And so would you, that's the main takeaway that you, that you took, was that how to, to compose a painting? Well, those first years mm -hmm. at, at RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. Right. And then I went on to um, another school in Massachusetts, and I ended up getting a master's degree. So I really have had a career mm -hmm. of doing art. Painting outside is obviously an important part of your work, your strategy as an artist. Do you paint other places and other times? Uh, I, I do. I, I paint indoors. I paint from photographs. I paint abstracts uh, as well. There's a new group in town. Uh, you know, it's really pretty much you're dealing with the same things. You're, you're a poet, mm -hmm. and we deal with some of the same elements, space, texture, and whether it's an abstract or still life or painting from plain air, mm -hmm. it's the same elements that you're dealing with. It really isn't that different. Yeah. Well, one of the things as a poet I always think is, when do I stop? What, what do I leave out? That seems to be at least as crucial as what you're putting in. Was that a consideration here in, in general? Absolutely. I think it's one of the most difficult things about painting is choosing the elements that you put in, just as you said about poetry. Yeah. Well, it's a great pleasure to talk to you, Nancy, and congratulations again for a beautiful painting. Thank you, David. I've enjoyed it, too. So, Lee Sparks, we are over here in your piece, In the Shade, which is going into the permanent collection. It is, so yeah. Is great. Um, these are the big sycamores over in uh, Tucker's Grove. In Tucker's Grove, yeah. yes. What was the decision to do that? Oh, I just, I love doing trees. It's kind of my specialty, or my friends say, and right. I love doing eucalyptus trees, and cypress, and the sycamores. Yeah. And in this example, there was just beautiful light of light and shadows. Uh -huh. and the bark of the tree being white and purple, which you, know, right. you don't always think about, oh, they're purple. Yeah. Well, that's obviously must be one thing that you notice a lot in plain art painting, but something that you thought you knew what a tree looked like, right. it's always looking different. Yeah, it's not what you think you see, it's mm -hmm. what you really pinpoint and look at and see in the shadows. Was hmm. this part of one of the scape paint outs? No, it was um, actually... A, Just you? Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, you have been part of the paint outs, though. Oh, yes. I go to almost every... Tell me about that, because, you know, one of the images that we have of, of the artist is this solitary creature sort of communing alone and looking to connect with the, you know, greater spirits. And the paint outs is a bunch of people probably yes. talking a little bit and stuff like that. What's the difference it is. between the two? Um, well, it's amazing that Scape, um, when I first started painting, which was not too long ago, you know, eight years, uh -huh. and I just started going to the paint outs and met and networked with all the other artists in Carpinteria and Santa Barbara, right. and it opened a whole new world. And a lot of people wonder, well, do you mind if I watch you paint? Like, how, how can you concentrate? Right. But I go, no, I started learning to paint at paint outs By and in the public, so I'm yeah. used to it. Yeah. I can paint under any circumstances yeah. now. 
But one of the things escape exhibit like this does is it donates part of the money to a good cause. In this case, it's the county parks. Um, why is that important to you? Well, actually, my family's lived in this area since the 1880s. Wow. And we're still ranching. And so my mission, I guess, is to really preserve the legacy mm -hmm. of rural Santa Barbara Where as did it you was. Grow up? In Carpentry. Uh -huh. On a ranch? Yes. So what do, you, what do you remember of those days of, in, in your youth and how they might have affected who you became as an artist? I guess just the stories from my grandmother. When she was a young lady, when they did summer jobs, they had to just go camp out in the orchards mm -hmm. and pick fruit and sleep in tents. Right. So I, I can just still visualize or right. smell that or see that. What about other work that you do? Are you primarily a plein air painter? I am, although I do have an art gallery in Carpinteria, mm -hmm. in plein air, and so I have to go there every day and paint, so right. I do a lot of studio work right. now. Right. Well, it's a fantastic piece of work. It's here um, at um, Near and Far, the exhibit at the Channing Peak, until mm -hmm. February the 15th, and then off to Santa Maria yeah. for, until May. And it's a great honor to be here, and actually I got word that I got the purchase on my birthday, first oh. thing in the morning, so it made my day. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, it's nice to talk oh, to you. Oh, thank you. So, Phil Victor Lomelli, we are here in front of your piece in this very busy corridor of the Jenny <laughs> Gallery. Um, this is called Say Tree and Clouds. It's beautiful, and, and as I look at it, I keep thinking it could be a painting by Pissarro if he had moved mm -hmm. to Santa Barbara. Um, tell me a little bit about your influences as a painter. Well, I started painting here at, at, at City College, and I was kind of an addict for the adult time while the world was in full bloom. Right. And that's where I met the people from Escape. I, I studied a little bit with, uh, with Ray Strong and Larry and John and his brothers and a lot of artists here mm -hmm. in town. Um, so those are some great teachers. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what did well, what, you learn from them? Appropriate everything. No, I have always had affinity for nature, mm -hmm. so even as a little kid. So painting nature just came as a, a natural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, show me the uh, show me the values and, co and how to how to mix the colors. So everything uh, to paint pertaining to how to from mixing the paints all the way to just how to put apply them on the canvas. You know, as we walk along, mm -hmm. uh, seeing so many of the paintings uh, in the show. Yours is kind of darker than the others, at least uh, not necessarily in subject matter, but in, in terms of. It's, it's been kind of a kind of a joke. A lot of, uh, one of the teachers told me that it was my uh, he, he turned mine my uh, mid new uh, high new nocturnes <laughs> because even though <laughs> <laughs> I could paint in it, they still have a, a darker right. value. I just paint, been painting with the three uh, primary colors mm -hmm. and then mix them. So I use I use the a, a, a red, a blue, and a yellow in the in the white as uh -huh. as, as a mixing agent. So when you're out there, um, you're often out there with other people because you're in charge of the paint outs for, for state, right. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, what's that like? Tell me about the experience of being out there with a bunch of other painters. It's, it's incredible. I always tell that we can be like two feet from each, uh, from each other and everybody has a different perspective of, of what to paint. Right. Not only the subject matter, that's, but also how they apply the colors, what colors they use, and what the, they, they choose as their, as, their main, uh, as their main feature, main focus. Are you ever surprised by people choosing something that you know you never would have thought was worthy of, of, a, of a painting? It's always that was a uh, surprise. Oh no, I would never have thought of the painting that the, the, that part of the painting. So I remember one time we took a, we sitting in a class at Galita Beach, and these people came from out east and they painted they painted the uh, ice plant uh, oh, flowers, seen, something yeah, that, right, we yeah. that we step that we normally right, step right, over. Right, yeah. and we <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So as you um, look around, I'm really curious about how important Scape is to you as, as an artist. I think I belong to most a lot of the organizations. I've been I've been mostly involved in Scape. I think mostly from the from inception. I've been in most in most of their shows, and I've been in charge of, of the paintouts every second Saturday of the month. From nine to noon, we have a we have a paint out. The information goes out, and we get anywhere from from three to maybe twenty people come and join come and join us. And, and it's incredible. You can you can watch and learn from different from different people. And sometimes people come and ask, well, "How did you get How did you get that color? How did you, How did you Are glaze?" You happy to explain? Yes, that? Mm -hmm. if I if I know the answers, but I also learn <laughs> I also learn from other uh, yeah. other artists as well. So again, people are watching the, the show and they are thinking, I would like to be a member of Scape. Mm -hmm. It's S 
hyphen a hyphen p scape dot org, right. and Correct. it's mm -hmm. just thirty five dollars to become a member. Correct. Mm -hmm. And what I like about scape is a not it's a non jury show, so anybody can everybody can join from all different different levels, mm -hmm. and uh, th the shows are juried, so we, that we have a qual quality shows, right. but everybody can can uh, can join scape. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. show. And you have another piece in here too. Um, mm -hmm. I. I I want to thank you so much. This is a, a piece that was purchased for the permanent collection. Yeah, it was, it was, they did was, during the first uh, ceremony or the opening ceremony. They announced that I was totally shocked that was the one that was uh, won that prize. Okay, so I'm very, mm, very honored. Yeah, it's <laughs> nice to talk to you. Thank you. Larry Iwerks, we got along the coast, the Gaviota Beach, uh, uh, one of the winners. Wow. Here. Yeah. Congratulations. Good thing for arbitrary decisions. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about this painting and about your work overall. I mean, it, it has these big kind of broad gestural, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of space in your thing. I don't think of you as an artist who's doing a lot of like tiny detailed work. Uh, it's true. I'm a brush, broad brush painter. Yeah. Sea to Shining Sea, America. I love it. Right. But Galita Beach is a beautiful place. Uh, I call this a plane painting because <laughs> I'm dealing with a lot of planes. Got the flat plane to the beach right. and the slanted plane as it approaches the surf and then the semi-slanted plane to the cliff. And as the fog recedes, uh, the sunlight comes in and hits the cliff extra bright. So I, I like the way that the, the uh, Monterey Shale cliff mm -hmm. came through the fog extra bright. Yeah. So that's what I tried to grab in this picture. Tell me about when you were actually painting this. Was this a solo or part of the paint out thing? How, how were you, where were you? I was out there uh, with some painters, but it wasn't one of the official paint the outs that groups, they had yeah. uh -huh. for this uh, particular show. But so, it's a great place for painters to go. And when, when you're there, you have a sense of, of centuries, if you will, because of the Shumash Indians mm -hmm. that used to come in and out of that estuary. So I love to go there and see the people just enjoying the day. Mm -hmm. We're so lucky to have that part. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your own career as an artist before we got up to this. I mean, you've been painting for a while. Yes, uh, I started out uh, painting on the walls when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and that's where you first get in trouble. Right. <laughs> and, uh, but fortunately, I had a, a painter family, so it was okay to make paintings. Right. And also a music family on uh, my mother's side. So it's very nice when you're a kid that they allow you to have the freedom to uh, explore. Right, kind of mark on stuff. Yeah, and then I went to John Muir Junior High School in Burbank, and I picked up kind of an environmental sense for the land. And so I've used my paintings a lot to try to bring attention to places that I think should be preserved and cared for. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I assume that you're a member of SCAPE. Yes, yeah, we're lucky to have a group where we can celebrate places and we can actually have a sale and then donate a, a large percentage to uh, help actually preserve that area. In this case, it, the money will go to help the, the Santa Barbara County Parks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You know, you're someone who's got a sense of humor, Larry. Uh, <laughs> does that make its way into your paintings at all? I mean, is there a sense of, of I don't know, just... Well, the, it is nice if, if you look at a painting and you say, wow, it has a sense of joy. Yeah. And so we all experience joy. And so I think when you come in to music and you come into painting, it's good to put the joy right into the painting. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that as a painter? Well, you just jump up and click your heels. <laughs> put in a little extra orange or yellow, I don't know. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, what is it just, is it part of that, this, the big brush strokes? Is that part of your sense of enthusiasm and exuberance? Well, landscape painting is a celebration of the earth. So when you go out and make a painting of a mountain or a cloud or that day, in a sense it's like going to the store and having a receipt. You have a, a token of that day. Mm -hmm. There's so much to explore. And the, fact, the way the light cascades across it or luminesces through a, a, a leaf, the study of light, we get to celebrate with Newton in this regard. You see reflections of the water. I was talking about the plane painting, how much light hits each plane. Some planes are hidden from the sun, so they're darker. Others face the sun, they're bright. So you can actually measure that by mixing gray values on your palette. And if you don't know the right color, you could get the right value. And you'd be surprised at how quickly you'll be painting mm -hmm. mountains, streams, rivers, beaches. 
because you have the proper value. Mm -hmm. A cloud might have a belly on it, a shadow belly, but it's a lighter shadow than a, a rock shadow. Mm -hmm. It's a lighter element. It's such a great thing that landscape painting is the song of the earth and a celebration of the earth. So I'd like to encourage everybody to go to the art store, get some colors, and go out and tackle a mountain. Mm -hmm. Now that's a great little moment to end on. Thank you so much. Yeah. We are going to finish up with you because you are the incoming president for a Southern California artist painting for the environment. Right. Um, and you are an artist whose work is in here, but um, you want to mention your friend's show. And we also, we haven't really talked about David Gallup, the, the, mm -hmm. the juror who sort of put all this, selected all the work. Tell yeah. us about him. Um, David Gallup, some people locally might be familiar with his work. He had a large painting called Twice Humbled at the Maritime Museum about seven, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And that went on to win the gold medal award of the California Art Club. It's a beautiful painting of the Channel Islands with orca whales and it was modeled after Monet's um, series of cathedral paintings. Mm, okay. Gorgeous painting. And I, I became familiar with him then and he did workshops for SCAPE. Yeah. And he's currently the vice president of the California Art Club. He's a nationally recognized artist, does beautiful, beautiful work, um, focusing right now on undersea, impre like kind of contemporary impressionist mm -hmm. type work. Yeah, it's Very dynamic I, artist. I, when I was um, uh, looking at Filiberto's uh, painting, I mentioned Pissarro and you just mentioned Monet, and we can see a lot of sense that, that French impressionism is Kind of still alive and well yeah. in a lot of the work. Well, they were the first uh, plein air painters, yeah. I think, where they called them glance painters because the light would be so intense to catch the light. You just kind uh -huh. of glance at it and try yeah. to try to catch it. Well, tell me, what else have we not mentioned about SCAPE that, um, as we've been talking to the different artists who are members? A lot of SCAPE is about the camaraderie, mm -hmm. people being together. It isn't just the paint outs. I mean, the paint outs are a huge part of it, but it's also um, organization that just kind of embraces everybody. Okay. People aren't juried in, we just welcome everyone. All of our shows are juried, like this show is highly juried, David's very selective. Mm -hmm. But we welcome everybody to come to the paint outs and to join the group and just be with us. It's just kind of the best of nature. both worlds. You yeah. can be with other painters, yeah. you're welcome, and yet when you are in an exhibit like the one near and far that we're looking at today, you know that you've received an honor. Yeah, and at a show like this, um, a lot of us weren't aware of a lot of the county parks. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that Halama Beach was a county park, so we had a paint out up there. Right. Franceschi Park. Yeah. I, I mean, mean you know, I didn't know the courthouse was a county park. Yeah, I mean, all these different venues that a lot of artists weren't aware of right. until this show came right. about. Sounds like a great opportunity yeah. for them to go around and explore the right. county. Right. Yeah. My friend Meg Ricks is um, back east, okay. so she was sorry to miss this, but she was the juror's choice. Okay. So this was the painting that David Gallup selected as his choice painting. And it's a small painting, but it really captured the scene. Nohoki Falls is a county park. Right. Um, and despite the drought, Meg went there and noticed the glow of the trickle of water on right. the moss yeah. and the dark cavern behind and the light coming from behind. So first she went there and did some gouache paintings and abstract paintings and was captured by the scene and so came back and did this out of using strictly a palette knife. Yeah. And, and that, that's one thing that plein air artists, it's so different than other art because you go out and you're in this huge totality of nature mm -hmm. and your job is to pinpoint what right. you want. And Meg did this incredible job. I mean, it just captured her spirit. We've heard a number of artists say light is changing all the yeah. time. It's it's a it can be as much as it's a joy to work outside. It's also mm -hmm. a, a difficult endeavor at times. I yeah, assume. but it's very addictive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once you do it, that's what you want to do. Well, thanks so much for um, having all the artists together and, and for being the, the incoming president of the okay. group. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you for doing this show. It's it's a great opportunity for us. Oh.
And now we're here in the studio of Ashley Brilliant. Let's head on inside and talk to him. Ashley Brilliant, thank you, first of all, so much for having us into your home, or it's your office. <laughs> it's it's a, a whole house full of your your, your everything that you have. Um, thank you for wanting to be here. Yeah, well, I mean, you're, you're a Santa Barbara icon. It's great to, uh, people will recognize your face, but they may recognize even more the, the, the pot shots. If I'm an have. icon, <laughs> I hope there are no iconoclasts out there. <laughs> I think there are plenty there of probably them in Santa are. Barbara, yeah. Um, we're going to kind of talk you through your whole career, if you don't mind. I, I'd like to, we're, we're going to focus obviously on, on the, the pot shots, your um, epigrams, uh, illustrated epigrams for which you are uh, renowned. But you weren't always an epigram epigrammatist. epigrammatist. Well, I was a college teacher at one time. Okay. Well, tell you, you were born in Britain, right? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Tell me a little bit about your, your childhood. I was born in 1933 in London. My father was a British civil servant. And uh, my mother was a Canadian who took me and my sister on a vacation in 1939 to visit her family in Canada. Good time. Yeah, yeah and the war broke out and we couldn't go back to England. My father was still there. So we were separated from him for two years and uh, lived in various apartments in Toronto. And finally, though, my father was fortunate enough to get a position with the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so we moved there, and we were there all through the American part of the war. And what development, or what, what role did that have on you as someone who became... Well, it made me a little American. Yeah. And when we went back to England after the war, I never really totally adjusted. And as soon as I had a chance, I went up through uh, high school and college in England, but as soon as I had a chance to uh, emigrate, I did. And I came to California. I had an uncle living in Los Angeles mm -hmm. who sponsored me, and I've been here ever since. Well, you, you spent some time in San Francisco uh, in yeah. the hate in the middle 60s, middle late 60s. That's right. I was sort of a mock hippie guru. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's a mock hippie guru? Well, I had a, I had a, uh, I was too old to be a hippie, really. For one thing, I was in my thirties already. Okay. And, Don't trust uh, anybody over there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I had just come off my, uh, a job uh, teaching on board a floating university, mm -hmm. sailing around the world. Right. Uh, I knew that I couldn't go back to that. It was uh, not the sort of thing you could do forever. But it was, it spoiled me for any other kind of teaching. And here was this incredible phenomenon of the hippie movement going on in San Francisco, and I had friends there. So I decided to um, uh, become part of it, and I had been writing these strange little lines. And I went into Golden Gate Park and stood up on a little uh, milk crate and used to recite them mm -hmm. and uh, talk about them and gathered quite a following for a short, wonderful time. <laughs> Well, now, when you think of epigrams, you think of uh, like the Greek book of, uh, of epigrams, you think of Roman epigrams. Is well, I never that, thought, I never feature? called them epigrams until my first book came out. Yeah. And I saw that the Library of Congress had classified, classified them as epigrams. Yeah. So but, they were just ideas? I called them pot shots. Uh -huh. Actually, at one point, I called them unpoemed titles. Because um, I, I had started by putting uh, the, the bottom of, of paintings that I was doing. And I found that people would sometimes buy the painting because they liked the title. <laughs> so I started, I, at first they were unpainted titles, but then I thought unpoem titles. Right. Well, there's a whole tradition of the, of the one-line poem. Typically there's a, 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 a title and then it feeds right into to the line, but for you, it, it's just the line itself. That's right? right, and it's never longer than 17 words. And why is that? That was a, a uh, I knew that <clears throat> I was creating a new form of literature, and it had to have some kind of structure. So somehow the number 17 came into my mind. It was partly inspired, I guess, by the haiku, right. but also I counted up the number of words and the ones that I'd already been doing, 
And I saw that none of them was longer than 16 words. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll give it's myself one more reason, word for yeah, emergency. Right. <laughs> now, I know I, that you've written some that are over 17. No, but, no, yeah. not deliberately. Okay. And if they put, somebody calls it to my attention, I, uh, I you, have to change it. it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the things that anyone who's seen your pot shots around town has bought one knows that they're illustrated. That's right. Generally. I, I started them. by doing all the illustrations myself. But I'm not a trained artist, and I found that people didn't care who did the art, so long as the art went well with the, right. with the words. So I became more and more eclectic as far as the illustrations went, and, as and long it, as the work was uh, out of copyright. Uh, so yeah, you see a lot of things that look like they're from the Victorian that's era. Right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, it could be Monty Python-esque in a way. Was there any sense that, that is that a, a... Not deliberate, although I, I'm a great fan of Monty Python. Yeah. So, I mean, when I look around your, your office, I'm just overwhelmed. You said you've done more than 10,000 published. Exactly 10,000. Exactly 10,000. <laughs> yeah, 10,000 published. Oh, yeah, I yeah. stopped at 10,000. But I keep writing them. I can't stop writing uh -huh. them. But you're not, you're not published I haven't published anymore. anymore. How long has it been? Several years now. I could go on, but um, there's no real financial incentive. I mean, who can master 10,000 uh, part shots? <laughs> Well, when you, you said this is a new form of literature, I mean, would you, and, and we, we see it in, in books, would, would you like it to be studied? Uh, yes, yes, that's my great hope, that it uh, become required reading in college courses. Uh, so far, that's only been true of one of my works, and it wasn't a part shot of my book about uh, the automobile uh -huh. in Southern California. <laughs> Well, it, the pot shots would be probably the most enjoyable uh, class that anybody would, <laughs> would take. Well, sooner or later, I'm sure. If I live long enough, I will live to see it happen. One, one of the things I think about literature is that it, it, it has to be replicated by other people. So do you think of other people writing uh, That's shots? interesting. Uh, wait a minute. I, I've never, never heard that before. Well, I mean, it won't be literature unless it's replicated well, by other people. Otherwise, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it can only be produced by one thing, it's this sui generis form that... That, that, that is not literature. Well, I know. I'm just, I'm asking you. It, it, well, I've never thought of that. Uh, I've always uh, wanted an apprentice. And I've, uh, I've given out all my rules. Uh, right. I, uh, there's a whole, there's a, a list of very strict rules of composition. And, and tell me, uh, this less than Well, one of them is a 17 word maximum, but right. it can be shorter than 17 okay. words. Another one, a very important one, is that it must be easy to translate into other languages. Right. Right. So therefore there can be no rhyme, no rhythm, no pun, no wordplay. Uh, none of the things that make it easy and fun <laughs> to write short expressions. <laughs> And uh, another very important rule is that uh, it, the words do not depend on the illustration. Right. They can be totally separate. Well, ha have you had them translated into other languages? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I've got a whole book that's uh, got them in French, German, and Spanish. Mm -hmm. And what, what response have you had from... Very little. <laughs> <laughs> So, but would you? But would you consider? You you said you're looking for an apprentice. If someone's watching this show right now and, and they say, "I want to be the next pot shot writer," w would you take that person under your wing? Uh, I can't believe that that would happen. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd certainly be happy to meet and talk with them and uh, see how serious they were. Right. Well, take take me. So we're we're in the the, the, the mid '60s, and I know there's a an, an album on your uh, wall in the other room. You made an album of a cappella um, songs. Yeah, the songs I sang in Golden Gate Park. Yeah, yes. and and you mentioned they're all about the hippie scene. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you might be willing to 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 sing one. Oh, I could spend the whole half hour singing. You <laughs> would you? You want could, one or two? Well, yeah, absolutely. In the state by the Golden Gate, there's a lovely city with a street named Hate. People see where there's liberty, and they never want to leave Hate Ashbury. And I'm glad to say I'm here to stay. Happiness has come my way. My mind is open and my heart is free. Till I t since I took a little trip on LSD. <laughs> it's too soon to embrace the moon, but the earth's delightful in the afternoon. You could hate the world and seek heaven above, but when you're in hate, Ashbury, hate means love. And I'm glad to say I'm here to stay. Happiness has come my way. 
My mind is open and my heart is free since I took a little trip on LSD. <laughs> Bravo. Well, you know what? I was as you're singing that. Let's 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 savor a couple more. If, if you're if you're willing, as we go through the show, we can kind of uh, we can hear hear a couple more songs. So, um, is 1967, 68. What, what, where you're singing that in Golden Gate Park, literally yeah, on, on yeah. a milk crate. Yeah. And and what it also eventually got published in a, in a book I brought out called the Haight Ashbury Songbook. Right. It was just a tabloid sold on the streets, but it became quite uh, quite popular. Uh -huh. uh, a big break came when the uh, columnist Herb Cain uh, took notice of it. Right. I became a sort of local celebrity. So you're a celebrity in San Francisco. How did you find your way down to Santa Barbara? Well, it was all through my wife. Her family has been here for generations, and she always wanted to live here. And finally, uh, I agreed. I had family in Los Angeles, so uh, one one day in 1973, we packed up everything and bought this little house and moved down here. And and this little house became your office. Yes. I, at first, it was our home too. But um, Dorothy's mother had a larger house up near the mission, so we moved uh, our living quarters there. And do you come down here every day? To every work? day, practically. Yeah. yeah. So when when you arrive, uh, you know you've got your whole life's work in here. What what what's the first thing you do, especially if you're not you're not publishing uh, new pot shots? Uh, first thing I do is usually look at the computer to see if any orders have come in, mm -hmm. because this is a, a business and we depend on orders. And if they have, uh, I have one assistant who's here three days a week, Peggy Sue. She would be here today. Unfortunately, she had a cold, so I asked, I told her to go home. Right. But well, tell me about the pot shots because that's it, there. There's something that every time our our camera crew was remarking on them as we walked in, and and you know whenever you see one, just about everyone seems to just kind of click. Are they things that come to you quickly and spontaneously, or is the there idea a uh, often comes quickly? But, but then working the expression on it is like itself. any other kind of a composition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I might have the idea around for for years before I uh, decide that it's in good enough form. As I look over, you know we got. And I could just read off the top, animals, confusion, uncertainty, fitness exercise and relaxation, anti-smoking. <laughs> Those are just various sets that we put yeah. together. Yeah. So uh, do, once you get on a roll with one or when you were, when you were writing them regularly, did you continue? No, I, that I never uh, decided in advance on subject. Uh, uh -huh. It was just, um, just spontaneous. And, 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 and just give me an example, or are you just sitting at the dinner table and suddenly it comes and you just shut it down? Maybe or? It's something I see on TV or something Dorothy says, or uh, I hear an expression. Um, what they usually are, if you analyze them, <clears throat> it'll begin with a, uh, with a more or less a common expression. Mm -hmm. And then the, the last part will be a, a twist. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, I didn't realize that myself till recently. Um, you asked me about how I broke my arm. I was at a conference uh, about words organized by uh, uh, Will Shorts back in uh, New York State, a place called Mohawk. <clears throat> and um, I gave a speech there. That's what I was doing there. Uh, and uh, in, in researching it, I, uh, I had to look up exactly what are epigrams <laughs> that I've been doing all these years. And that's where I realized that uh, epigrams usually do have a twist in them, mm -hmm. um, just like that. And incidentally, just after I gave the speech, I went out on a short hike. The ground was icy and I slipped and, that was <laughs> <laughs> and I broke my right arm. Yeah. That was um, uh, nearly five weeks ago now. So I, I, I hate to put you on the spot here, Ashley, but it, if I were to ask you to recite a few of your favorite pot shots. Um, well, the one that I always say is my favorite <clears throat> says, fundamentally, there may be no basis for anything, but uh, it's not a popular one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a short one. It, yeah, it, yeah. I, I mean the the ones. It's funny. It probably is a kind of a Rorschach test. To, uh, which ones uh, appeal most to you? Because I was saying to me the ones that have a little bit of a nasty edge. At the, one at of the, the ones that uh, that I particularly like says, 
uh, life is the only game in which the object of the game is to learn the rules. That could almost classify as an aphorism. People often think that my uh, epigrams are aphorisms. And what's the difference? Well, aphorisms are all of a, a certain type. They make statements. They're very serious. They're philosophical, usually. Epigrams have a much broader range. They can be humorous. They can be crazy. <clears throat> mm -hmm. what, what's a crazy one? Uh, hello forever. <laughs> you Just have two words. <laughs> You have a lot about love. I mean, that's that's clearly a subject that's going to be appealing to people, uh, you know, perennially. Uh, what, what, what are some of the ones that, that come to mind for you? You can copy it to your heart's content. You only love me because you're afraid not to. Time can never change my love for you, but may unfortunately change my ability to express it. <laughs> Will you still love me when I'm no longer lovable? If everybody loved me except you, I wouldn't be satisfied. I'd still want your love too. What good is your love if I can never take it for granted? We might as well face the truth. The truth is that we're both wonderful. I can read lips, but only with my own. I'm enjoying the story of our love so much. I hope I never get to the end. Save time. Love me first. Get to know me later. You know, you let me uh, uh, start. I could go on and <laughs> you on. You could go on for yeah, ten thousand. You don't want to. <laughs> well, There's lots of other subjects. So the the ones that are 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 kind of sentimental and, and kind of deeply full of love. Are those things that you had thought about your wife. How did? Uh, uh, Say yes, I, by the way. <laughs> well, I love my wife. Yes, I love my wife. But I don't necessarily um, devote, uh, dedicate them to her. She often gives me ideas for all different kinds of lives. Right. Tell me a little bit about um, being here in Santa Barbara. And uh, one thing I'm, I'm interested in is that you are, as you said, you, you come to work where are my orders? I'm a, you're a business person. Um, people will have seen these racks in stores around town. Um, but did you ever think oh, I should just license these out to somebody and um, and forget all the you know the, the the work that goes with it here? Well, my it's been available for anybody uh, made me an offer. Um, I do license uh, uh, my work to Individual different companies. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. but the whole business uh, nobody yet has expressed an interest in uh, in the licensing it. Uh, I'm 81 years old now. It might be an appropriate time, but uh, but uh, it also is something that keeps me busy and occupied. Right. Well, I, I saw that when we walked in, there was a outside your house. There's a little article about Mark Jacobs. Tell me that. that oh story. yeah, uh, amazing, isn't it? Uh, a company like Mark Jacobs got interested in uh, using some of my work on some of their products. And they're only just coming on, onto the market now. I haven't been in any of their stores, so I haven't seen them. I have a box of samples. Um, oh, that's a huge, uh, gigantic market, isn't it? Uh, um, maybe. <laughs> or is, or is, is your name? I had. John, I, I got to be honest. I had never heard of Mark Jacobs <laughs> before they approached me. And did they say how they came across your work? Well, finally, I, I did get a letter from somebody uh, who said it was his idea originally. Uh, he's one of the members of the firm, but he's no longer with that department. Uh -huh. But he wanted me to know that it was through him right. that uh, it came about. So, w will it will it say Ashley Brilliant below, or is it just the? Just yeah, the, it's got my name on it. It's got my name. signature. Yeah. So that's a fantastic uh, way to get the get the work out to the public. Well, I mean, it's I mean, in a, it's I've in licensed my work to many companies yeah. over the years, including some big uh, uh, fashion companies like Zara. Right. They put me on T-shirts. Uh, so nothing new about that. Yeah. Well, what, I mean, as you think about your legacy, what what, what do you want it to be? Legacy? I yeah. hate that uh, word. Well, you it's know? too bad. I already asked the question. <laughs> I, I, do, I have no legacy. Well, you certainly do. I mean, you've, you've created legacy all this Legacy means work. something you leave after you're dead. Well, but I mean, what, 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 what do you... What is that thing? I think about it. I'm 30 years younger than you are. What's my legacy going to be? I don't think in terms of legacy. 
I think uh, uh, what happens while I'm alive is all that matters to me. And what, what do you want that to be? While I'm alive, yeah. I want to win the Nobel Prize for literature. I want to be acknowledged and accepted in universities, and as you said, taught in courses. Mm -hmm. And is there a, a, a pragmatic way to, to make that happen? How do you get the work out there to those professors who might teach the... Uh, well, I did just recently speak at a college uh, in um, uh, Binghamton, uh, in New York. Right. Uh, but that was only because I was going to give that other speech where I broke my arm. And uh, this, this man who was uh, living in Binghamton, which is not that far from Mohawk, said, well, if you're going there, why don't you come here to our college and, and uh, give a speech? So I did. Uh, but I don't often get uh, invited to uh, academic occasions. Well, maybe someone will watching will be. I hope to. so. Yes, I'm. I'm available. One of the one of the the uh, pieces that I looked at recently is a film that um, David Peacock made about you called Ashley. Brown oh yeah, that's Barbara. remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, he's he's clearly someone who um, he's a gets very talented work. filmmaker, yeah. and uh, he did an uh, incredible job. <laughs> What's that like to have someone following you around? Uh, Town, like. Well, it's not the first time uh, that that has happened. The New uh, Wall Street Journal actually sent a reporter here at one time uh, who followed me around for several days. Uh, to, to, uh, I can live with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, when, you, when you go into your website, which is ashleybrilliant.com, um, people can, can look and they can purchase a lot of the stuff that, that we're seeing all around mm -hmm. us. Um, there's also a, a sidebar that has a couple of interesting things that are, are unrelated to your work with the pot shots. One of them is the, the leaf blowers. Um, oh, yes. Well, locally in Santa Barbara, I'm still known as the man who uh, got rid of the leaf blowers. Yeah, the gasoline-powered leaf blowers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Talk, talk about Unfortunately, that. it hasn't been a total success, but uh, we have far less of a problem than it was at one time. And why was that something that was concerning you? Oh, I just hate noise. It's one of my big bugaboos, noise and litter and people who don't flush toilets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, uh, the leaf bars in particular, I found, were not only annoying to me, but to thousands of other people. So we organized a movement. We called it uh, 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 BLAST, uh, Ban Leaf Blowers and Save Our Town. And it required getting on the ballot, which required uh, 9,000 signatures, which took several months. And so, so it was a big, a big event in my life, and people still remember that. Yeah. Well, and you live in a very quiet, or your, your office is in a very quiet place, so I haven't heard a peep outside. Oh, sometimes you do. Sometimes yeah. you do, even here, unfortunately. T tell me a, a, a little bit more about your day. So I'm interested in, you, you're here in the office, are you here from 9 to well, 5? Well, now that my wife is, uh, is an invalid, I have to spend part of the day uh, helping her get up and get ready. But she also has caregivers coming in. And I have breakfast at home, and then I come down here usually. On your uh, bicycle? Well, usually, except now that I broke my arm, yeah. I can't uh, ride a bike, and I can't even drive. But I'm hoping to eventually. And so I do a lot of walking. I walk all over town. Even to get to my uh, therapist, uh, I, I, I'm my physical therapist, I have to walk from here down to Haley and, and, and Bath Street. That's a 40, 45 minute walk yeah. one way. Well, I just think of you as someone that I have seen walking down the streets of Santa Barbara. Yeah, or, I'm, or I'm a big of, walker. Yeah. <laughs> We got about a, a less than five minutes left, and I'd like to get at least one more song in. W would you? Would you be willing to? Yeah, another song. My grandfather's pot was too hot for the shelf. It was kept in a hole in the floor, and when Granny and he had a smoke with their tea, they would lock every window and door, for they trembled with fright that their clandestine delight would scandalize all of the town. So they died high, too afraid to cry, when the house burned down. Ninety years, timid turning on, pity pot, pity pot, their home brightly burning on, 
Pity pot, pity pot, they died high, too afraid to cry when the house burned down. So, pot, <laughs> it's a pot shot. I mean, was that was that originally well, a pot shot? Uh, is it is an easy shot, the, uh, but it's clearly uh, a pun. Uh, um, there are three uh, connotations: the, the marijuana. There's the um, uh, shooting at random, hoping right. to hit a good target, and also shooting to get something to fill your pot uh, to make a living. Mm -hmm. And the, and these works do kind of fulfill all those. Well, maybe yeah. Different times, yeah. I particularly like the idea of firing at random, hoping to hit a target. Because yeah. I never know who my line is going to reach or how it's going to affect them. And sometimes, years after I've thought of something, uh, a person will say, you don't know how that changed my life. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's got to be pretty gratifying. Uh, it, it is, uh, uh, although I've got so used to it. <laughs> I, I, I get lots and lots of praise. If, if all the praise I got was worth money, <laughs> I would be very be wealthy. A billionaire. Yeah. Well, as we kind of wind up, um, as you say so long to folks in this particular segment, um, what would what, what final words for the for the show? I would like to thank all of my loyal fans out there who have kept me going all these years, and I hope that I've helped to keep you going too. And for a final song. Here's one about a uh, clergyman who got involved with the hippies. I wonder where old Father Fallon has been. Such curious behavior I never have seen. He says there's a brand new salvation from sin and that man's only got to turn on and tune in. Sing to rely, rely, rely. He's made a new surplice all dappled with flowers. He talks about love now for hours and hours. He says if to crucify people is wrong, well, I really have crucified myself too long. He's given up shaven, he's growing a beard. He says there's no hell but the church to be feared. He'll drink no more wine, sure he turned down a glass. But he served chocolate brownies last night at the mass. Sing to rely, rely, rely. The whole congregation has thrown up its hands. But the father says, I'll surmount their reprimands. If the bishops and cardinals offer no hope, it will be my life's purpose to turn on the Pope. <laughs> Ashley Brilliant, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you, David. Thanks again for watching The Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey. And as always, our show is sponsored with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. Thanks for watching.